Li Shangjing, untitled. There is only, behind the Mika screen, a beautiful woman. Winter is over in the capital. She dreads these new spring nights. If she hadn't married such a high-ranking husband, he wouldn't leave the perfumed bed to serve at morning audience. So we continue with Li Shang Jin's heptasyllabic quatrains. This is the third out of seven. Now, as I said, this poem doesn't really have a title. In, in this translation by Jeffrey Waters, the first uh, three words of the first line are given as a title. There is only. Uh, Li Shangjing was famous for writing poems without titles, and uh, this contributed probably to the uh, ambiguity and uh, mm, suggestiveness of these texts. Now, the topic of this quatrain is one that we've encountered in a different form very frequently in this anthology. It is the lover's complaint, or rather we could say here the wife's lament. In, in a way, it does match the two previous poems by Li Shangjing on being a poem about separation. If the first one that we read, Night Rain Sent North, was a separation of husband and wife because the husband is far away, and the second one, the message to Secretary Ling Hu, was separation of friends, this one is a separate, this feels more fictional, less autobiographical than the others, and it seems to convey, you know, just the separation of uh, a husband and wife, um, because the husband is serving at court. So the basic message in this story is you have this wife of an important um, civil servant, and she laments that because her husband is a high-ranking uh, member of the bureaucracy, he has to leave uh, pretty early to attend uh, imperial audiences, and so she's alone at home. So, in a way, many of the ideas that this short poem develops are connected with the type of poetry that we talked about in previous uh, poems that we call the uh, Kung Tishi, the, the palace-style poem, and in that, that sort of poetry, the typical protagonist is this beautiful concubine in the imperial palace, unable to... Um, to, to, to get out of the imperial residence, feeling lonely, sad, and forlorn, not being visited by the emperor, and therefore wasting away in luxurious and splendid surroundings, when, with the woman being described as, in a way, as an object, as one of these beautiful uh, items uh, enclosed within the imperial palace. Now, this poem doesn't exactly fit the bill, because the protagonist, although she is a beautiful, ennui laden, solitary lady in, in, in relatively close quarters, that lady is not a concubine, she is the wife of a husband. And the, the separation from the husband does seem to me a bit overplayed. Like, it's not like her husband is far away or in the provinces or anything. He's just serving at the court, so I imagine she would still see him every day. So, you know, that surprises me a bit. I don't quite, don't quite get it. But anyway, that would be the topic of the poem, uh, separation of, 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 of lovers. Perhaps she's a young wife and you know she's really keen on being with her husband, but that is not um, explicitly stated in the poem. So as I said, the topic is separation. Implicitly there's this uh, echoing of the theme of the beautiful bell, the beautiful uh, ennui laden bell, within closed quarters, and uh, I wouldn't say there is a cesura between the first and the second couplets. I believe they all flow pretty naturally in telling the anecdote, which, you know, in a short paraphrase is, the lady is sad when spring comes, which is the season of love and happiness, because she can't spend uh, all the time she wished, especially the nights, with her husband, because he has to do his um, duties at the imperial palace. Let's take a look at the couplets. As usual, first couplet, there is only, behind the Mika screen, a beautiful woman. Winter is over in the capital. She dreads these new spring nights. So the first line clearly locates us into a scene. And the scene is presided by one object, basically, a Mika screen. Mm, this would be a paper screen, I imagine. Um, 
the, the, there was a, a, a Chinese and also a Japanese tradition of decorating paper screens with uh, precious filings of gold and silver, um, painting them. Um, it could be silk as well, but because of the Mika, uh, I probably imagine it's a paper screen, because Mika, which is a very shiny type of rock, was very usually um, cut into slices or grounded and mixed with paper to make it, you know, shiny, brighty, metallic-like. So we have this precious screen, which you know, denotes opulence, luxuriousness, and it's hiding something or somebody. Uh, it's a screen in a dormitory. But the emphasis is that there is only a beautiful woman behind the screen. That is, she is alone. So, so already this first line is painting us the picture of the lonely woman in luxurious apartments. And as I said, echoing all the, all the, all the images, all the preconceptions of the, the lonely palace belle in her luxurious quarters suffering from loneliness. Second line, the second line doesn't quite dispel these preconceptions because she, it, it just continues developing the topic. Winter is over in the capital. She dreads these new spring nights. So winter is over, which is the sad, depressing, melancholy season. It's the capital. So, so again, a reader that hasn't reached the third or fourth lines yet might still be thinking that this poem is about an imperial concubine in the imperial palace. The winter is over in the capital. She dreads these new spring nights. Now, spring, as you know, is always the season of happiness, of love, of courting, of mating. So it's a priori unusual for a person, for a woman, to dread the spring nights unless there is a cause. And as we know in all these poems, the implicit cause is that while others might be enjoying the spring with their beloved ones, while the whole of the universe, while nature is in its spring mode and animals and plants are flourishing and reproducing and so on. She alone is in contrast with the cycles of nature and of society because she is lonely, because her paramour is not with her. So that's why she dreads the spring nights, because they're nights of loneliness at the precise moment of the year, of the year when they should be the least lonely. Okay, we'll continue with the second couplet. I would say now that there is a little cesura in that the second couplet dispels a lot of these preconceptions that the first couplet generates. So the second couplet goes, If she hadn't married such a high-ranking husband, he wouldn't leave the perfumed bed to serve a morning audience. So the second couplet is a hypothetical. It's an if... A conditional clause. And a uh, third conditional. Yeah, because it's something that could have been changed in the past, but <laughs> it's not possible to change anymore. So this is actually, this woman who is languishing in spring in the secluded quarters is not an imperial concubine. She is the wife of a high officer. If she hadn't married a high-ranking husband, so she's probably married a person who occupies high posts in the bureaucracy. So if she hadn't married him, she wouldn't be left alone at night. So he wouldn't leave the perfume bed to serve at morning audience. Uh, I think we've talked about morning audiences before because there were a couple of poems describing the morning audience of scholar officials with the emperor. Even though it's called morning audience, this audi these first audiences of the day with the emperor took place very, very early indeed. And in fact, uh, scholar officials usually had to leave from their residences to the imperial palace when it was still pitch black night. I think at, at, at six in the morning, if not earlier, they were expected to be um, in front of the palace gates and th there they would still have to go through a lengthy process of, 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 of checking and of gaining access and of being searched for weapons and any other items and checking that they're in the imperial roster, that they're allowed to, to enter uh, the, the audience hall to see the emperor and bow before him. So, although it is a morning audience, this high-ranking husband would probably have to leave uh, his wife's bed in, I would say, probably in the middle of the night, maybe depending on where he lived, maybe at four o'clock or five o'clock in the morning. And, yeah, I think that's it. This poem doesn't really have much more to it. There aren't any um, historical or cultural references that are difficult to the code and a required explanation. As I said, the thing that surprises me is that it seems an exaggerated emphasis 
uh, to, to be to be to be developed in a poem the, the separation of of a wife and her husband for the morning audience like there are usually these separations that are sung in these poems are longer separations in space and in time but anyway uh an interesting slight subversion of expectations for the reader i imagine at least for me it was <laughs> 